Welcome to the Standard of Truth podcast. In this podcast, Dr. Garrett Dirkmont and Professor Richard LaDuke explore the early history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the life and teachings of Prophet Joseph Smith. They examine the original historical sources and provide context for events of the past. They approach the history of the Church with faith, expertise, and humor. Hi, welcome to another episode of the Standard of Truth Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Garrett Dirkmont, and I'm joined by my friend, Professor Richard LaDuke. Hello, Garrett. In this week's podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about the name of the church and the the changes to the name over the history of the church. But first, we're going to start with a couple of emails here. Um, This first one comes to us from Angie, layperson here. So not not my wife. (laughs) Maybe. This would be a very (laughs) passive-aggressive way of, you know, email from Angie, hey, there's a lawn that needs mowed or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I just have the I just have the first name, so it's possible. Um, lay person here, and hopefully haven't sent anyone astray when I teach. As you were talking about us common folk uh, teaching at our best ability, I remember a time when I stopped by a comment, or I was stopped by a comment, Another teacher made during one of my lessons. I did not know for sure what she said was correct, but it bothered me. And I came home from church and tried to research it. I could not find an answer, so I did the next best thing. I called the bishop's wife, and she asked if she would mind asking her husband if he knew. She responded a bit later, saying that they have not found a definitive answer and that it should not worry me. We were talking in Young Women's about families, and a leader said, very matter of fact, that we picked our families in heaven. Did we? Maybe I was being very cautious due to a few young women being adopted, and I wondered, or I was wondering, what they thought of this. I feel kind of stupid asking this, as I believe that we have loved ones on the other side of the veil that are close to us and help us every day. But when I tried to find this, and I felt I really gave it a valiant effort, I could find I could not find an answer. Did I miss anything? Maybe didn't use the correct wordage when searching. I just wondered if your research, in your research, you can recall coming across something like this. If it was easy to find, please make it sound like it was a bit of a struggle to find just for me. Thank you, Angie. Angie, we have combed through the, the internet. The depths of our research knows that we've hired multiple research assistants. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I think we're up to 13 now that are just combing through the internet. We have them searching through microfilm and all yeah, of the things. They're, at, they're in the granite... <laughs> Mountain Records Vault, <laughs> as we speak, and um, but, but we think we've come across something. Uh, well, so first of all, Angie, um, it's not a dumb question at all. It's a great question because it is one of the common cultural things that you hear. Now, we're about to lose most of our listeners. Well, but I'm not a fan of the movie Saturday's Warriors. Well, so based on the documentary Saturday's Warriors, we know um, from. From that is that obviously um, we knew each other before we came as families and then we said find me and we came yeah. down and we and found I'll, him I'll preach the gospel yeah, yeah. and then he would possibly steal our girlfriends. I think it's a definite steal the girlfriend, <laughs> right? Isn't that that's right? Yeah. Well, so my, my uh, in fact Becky, uh, her my wife, her uh, boyfriend uh, was serving faithfully on a mission in Brazil. Uh, didn't come back quick enough as I left before him, came back before mm-hmm. him, and uh, you moved swept in her off her kill. feet. Absolutely, <laughs> it's a it's a classic Latter Day Saint move. Um, and so, but based but based on that documentary, Saturday's Warriors, we do get the idea that I don't know how they got cameras up there. But. Well, so this is a very unique Latter Day Saint question. So this, even the fact that you have this question, is is a great demonstration of how Latter Day Saint theology is so incredibly different from Christian theology that you don't even have this question if you are a Presbyterian, right? If, if you're just an evangelical Christian, you don't have this question because you have no pre-existence. The pre-existence answers all kinds of questions, and we've spent time on this podcast, well, not, not today's podcast, 
No. Not yet, anyway. No, we will, though. We'll, we're going to get to it. Season 38. We're not getting to it. Now, we've spent time uh, on previous episodes of the podcast talking about just how important the doctrine of, of pre-mortal life is, that it is the the missing understanding that for that helps us understand at least part of the purpose of this life, helps us understand who we are, what our relationship to God is. It is the most important Latter-day Saint doctrine. Now, look, I'm not saying that, you know, obviously the what atonement about- of Jesus Christ is the most important. Then but, ham radios. You know, then, then ham radios. Then food storage. Then premortal life. No emergency preparedness coordinator. <laughs> then premortal life. No, I mean, when I say that, what I mean is as far as unique doctrines. I mean, Latter Day Saints. Obviously, Jesus is the center of our church. That's why it's the Church of Jesus Christ, and every believer in the church believes the only way they are saved is through the atonement of Jesus Christ. But many Christians believe that. In fact, to be a Christian is to believe your salvation comes through Jesus Christ. So that's not a unique doctrine. That, that Now, how we understand the atonement obviously is unique. That, that, but the most of our unique theology stems from this idea that we weren't just created out of nothing all at once. The idea of ex nihilo creation, the idea that God snapped his fingers and then you were conceived in the womb because you didn't exist before that. When I say that other Christians don't believe in a preexistence, I'm not saying that they believe that God created us as a spirit and then sent us down. Even that part doesn't exist. God created us at the moment of our conception and for some Christians at the moment of our birth. But at any rate, you didn't exist before you came here. So whatever family you were born into, you couldn't possibly have chosen them because you didn't exist. In addition to that, though, even when you leave here, you're not going to be with that family. At least not in the same sense that Latter-day Saints think. Now, now, in fairness, most Christians believe that heaven will be, you know, them being with their family. And so sometimes it falls a little bit flat when Latter-day Saints say, well, you know, we believe families can be together forever. But we're all together forever. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, the way I've heard a Christian pastor describe it is, um, well, you sure you'll you'll be in heaven with your wife. You won't be married because marriage is just for this earth. Uh, and, 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 you know, you'll interact with them there, but, but you'll be in the presence of Jesus. So you couldn't possibly care about anything else. You, you, the greatest joy you can experience is being in the presence of Jesus. And so therefore it's not like you hate the people that were members of your family or your spouse, but the, the, the glory of the Lord and your determination to praise him will be so great that, you know, essentially, yeah, your spouse will be there, but you couldn't possibly care that they were there because the greatest pleasure in the world is already there in the face of Jesus. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not the most effective door approach, uh, uh, for a Latter-day Saint to say, you know, we want to share a message about how families can be together forever in part because most Christians already believe that culturally, even though when you drill down into the theology, you find, well, it kind of sounds like you don't believe that. I mean, but, but it, it, it makes it less effective as a, as a conversation starter. Now, if someone's lost a child or something like that, well, that makes sense why they really want to know what's going to happen in the next life. At any rate, this question is not a question that's asked by other Christians because there is no preexistent life. And so you certainly have no choice. Now, you know, as we've talked about Calvinist and Reformed theology on the podcast, notice that that means who is making the decision of what family you're born into? Well, it's 100% God, right? Because God created you out of nothing. So the only deciding, the only moving factor in your creation, the only agency that is at display in your creation and in the rest of your salvation to a Reformed theologian is, is God. God chose to create you. God in choosing to create you knew who your parents would be, whether he selected them or not. I mean, it's, it's always a very fine line when you're dealing with reform theology, because 
God is all powerful, which means God can do everything proactively, or God cannot do something, but still know what the result will be if God doesn't intervene, which isn't as proactive. It's not God exercising God's power, but God is exercising his power of ultimate foreknowledge. So therefore, God already knows what your family life is going to be like. Now, I think in good family situations, the idea of, you know, we 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 chose our families before we came here sounds very positive. I and mean, it's a way of of, of of you know strengthening the family bonds that that we we know go on after this life. But maybe there was a family bond even before we came here. Now, of course, as as you pointed out in your email, not everyone came from the greatest family situation. So then what? I mean, uh, well, I chose my family knowing that, you know, they were going to abandon me as a two-year-old and 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 feed me heroin before they did it. <laughs> but you you can see how a person, you know, that this idea would help them perhaps maybe with more patience with family members or like, well, I I, I chose this, so I you know that that people use it maybe even ways to cope with aspects. Of I think this. so, and well, I think it's just. Once you say there's a pre-mortal life and that we all lived before we came here, one of the the burning questions immediately becomes, what was that like? So what do I know? I know that I'm here now, right? You know, I think therefore I am. So we got that part, right? We we know we exist now, and we we have all kinds of theology on what it will be like after this life. Now, now we don't understand how it will work. We understand that families will be together. That's not the same thing as, you know, I don't know what color the fence is around our mansion in heaven. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't know how we interact with one another in the celestial kingdom. That we interact with one another, that sounds, you know, that, that, that's been repeated. But how those things work, I don't think they've been fully revealed. Well, even less has been revealed about our pre-mortal life. Uh, Brigham Young giving a, a, a talk about this. Um, I don't have this in front of me, so I'm just going to paraphrase this. Um, he, he talked about the fact that all the things that came before this life, we can't comprehend. In fact, he said, we are not capacitated to comprehend them. It, suggesting that, you know, linear time is is actually a fairly easy concept to conceive of going forward. All of us have experienced time. All of us, you know, there was a past, present, and a future, even, you know, to this podcast, right? You Before you started listening to it, two minutes in, you stopped listening to it. The people that are still listening to it because they're in the back of a squad car somewhere. Uh, it, 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 or perhaps it, a one-year-old child. Or perhaps a one-year-old child. I have to say, ran into Sally, who told us about strapping her daughter into the car and, and forcing her. No, just that she was listening while she drove around. Um, my son was in a high school play and um, it was the final night. Uh, and as he, you know, went out into the hallway and we were meeting and greeting everybody there, ran into Sally and her husband, who I guess recognized me because of, you know, all the Photoshop work we've done to make myself look better. And, um, and it was great to meet her. Um, so it's it great to put a name to a face there. And it was just by by sheer chance. I, you know, they were out here visiting family and and you know, nothing else is going on in Spanish Fork. You know what? Let's go to <laughs> let's go to the high school play. Everyone wants to go to that. My son did a great job and it was it was awesome actually. But this concept of of time, you know, that it's just so hard to comprehend, right? Time is something you understand through experience. And I don't want to get into you know, Einstein's general theory of relativity or anything. But at least Brigham Young's explaining that the way we are created in this world makes it so we can't, at least in any real way, comprehend pre-mortal life. Why? Well, I think it's because we all experience life today, you know, and, and even when we talk about someone dying, right? we can still perceive of after every tomorrow, there's another tomorrow, right? That, okay, so I don't have a body anymore, but you know, the sun still rises and sets, you know, I, I float around, I haunt my family, you know, I'm, 
I'm moving things around. I'm switching things up, you know, like putting Tabasco sauce in the shampoo and stuff like that. You know. Yeah. The good yeah. stuff. Yeah. I figure that, that that's what you do as a haunting. Yeah. You know, yeah. You're doing ghost. a lot of temple work and occasional Tabasco shampoo swapping. I figure most of it's Tabasco shampoo. <laughs> With occasional temple well, work? Well, I mean. So it, you are the same I, person there as you I are here. I even have a <laughs> yeah. temple recommend there. Like, what's the process? <laughs> what do I have to go through? Have you paid your tithing? I don't have any money. Well, you have okay, to figure out how to pay your tithing. <laughs> So anyway, uh, the, the, the idea that after every tomorrow, there's another tomorrow is actually, you know, it, it's mind boggling when you, when you say things like billions of years, but it's still somewhat comprehensible to us. The idea that before every yesterday, there was another yesterday is not Right. Because where we all want to get with our finite minds and our, you know, secular knowledge is to the grand beginning, right? And as the song, If You Could Hide a Co-op points out, you know, you can't, you can't get to the beginning. Now, again, people are saying, no, no, there, there had to be a beginning. I, I, I agree with my finite mind. There had to be a time, but. Frankly, this is something that all Christians have always asserted, that God has always existed. When you say, what was the beginning for God? The answer is, for a Christian, there isn't a beginning for God. The aseity of God. God has always existed. And he existed outside of space and time. God created space and time at some point and and. And as we said before, hell for people ask questions about what God was doing before that. For Latter-day Saints, our conception of God and our pre-mortal life and who we are is so incredibly different that it begs these other questions. Because Joseph is going to teach in DNC 93 that man was also in the beginning with God. Joseph is going to teach in multiple sermons that the spirit of man is eternal, that there's no creation about it, that, that intelligence is, is not created or made, neither indeed can be. That is a very different concept because it's not just a concept of, of us existing before we got here. It's a concept of us being the same type of being that our Heavenly Father is. Now, at some point, we're going to do a multi-part. We're, we're never going. I looked on, over at Richard. King Follett sermon? On the King Follett sermon. Well, Brady wants it so bad. Yeah, so Brady, our, our friend, uh, he's, we we did a prelim for him. We, yeah, we did a part one like two and a half years yeah, we, ago. We did it back before I had gray hair, <laughs> before, before, you know. In the long, long ago. I mean. It was probably sometime before Willard Richards emptied the the seventh pistol that he had into the wall at Carthage. Yeah, it uh, was. It it was so it was it was it was great. Uh, we haven't released it. Uh, it's it's good stuff. Um, if but, we go back, I'm sure it's all garbage. <laughs> it probably is. But but in that you know as as Garrett does, he was setting up the the context around what's happening when Joseph is preaching that. That particular, and it's beautiful. It's a well. It's, we'll we'll see how you know. We'll let the listeners be the judge when you finally get it. Uh, but but this idea that that um, God came to be God, that that you know, as as many listeners know, you know, as man is God once was, that idea that God progressed to become God is one of the most unique and certainly to Christians, the most blasphemous doctrine Latter-day Saints have. And then when Joseph reveals that it's not just that God came to be God, but that we are the same types of beings that God is, and that we have the ability to progress to become like God as well. I mean, the blasphemy is on top of blasphemy. It's 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 a it's an explosion of blasphemy. It's 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 the it's the Fourth of July <laughs> blasphemy celebration with rockets, you know, you know, flying through the air and spelling out "Welcome to Hell" in you know dark red letters. I mean, so so all of this goes back to to that question of of how is it then 
that we constituted our pre-mortal life. And it's not just Saturday's warrior, though we joked about it, that kind of makes this idea of, of choosing our families. But I, though I will say, probably movie like that or, 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 you know, that's probably what's driving it in popular culture. You'll notice you can't think of, or, uh, you know, as you were searching, Angie, you weren't able to find a, you know, recent conference talk where the, the apostle was like, now let me explain to you how we chose our families in the pre-mortal life, right? And then the tabernacle choir will sing, will I wait for you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> will I wait for you? Anyway, um, uh, so you notice when you did your, your, your research that you couldn't find something like that. This is something that, of course, someone might speculate on. But but as as you pointed out, the, the problem isn't that someone might have that feeling that we had some part in choosing our families. The problem is it was stated as a matter of fact statement of faith to a group of young women who who aren't doing the research that you're doing, Angie, who who aren't thinking through all of the nuances of the problematic nature of if that is the case, what about all the horror show family situations? You as a leader, you know, obviously a compassionate leader for, for those girls, you were thinking that you were thinking, now hold on here. That sounds great for the people in a great situation. But could be a faith crisis for somebody that's like, well, what about my situation? Yeah, I mean, what if my dad is, is abusive? Yeah, I chose him because I, I wanted him to, to, to beat me. Yeah, I mean, that kind of stuff. Now, of course, someone who believes in that might get around that by saying, well, you know, agency. You chose him, and then he came down, he went through the veil, and he became a drunk, and that's why he hits you. But it, it, the important aspect of this is to know that we don't have doctrine that says that's the case. I will state that there is one other thing that has made its way into some culture um, that that promotes this more than other things, and that is the vision of Mosiah Hancock. Now, Mosiah Hancock, he is uh, the he's the son of one of the uh, one of my heroes of church history, Levi Hancock. Levi Hancock, we've talked about him before. He's one of the early converts in Kirtland. And he's one of the ones who, uh, when the missionaries convert everybody and then the missionaries leave and they go to Missouri and, and there's just all kinds of crazy stuff going on. I mean, people are sliding across the floor. There's Bibles flapping their way through the air. People are, are saying that words are landing on the air onto their hands and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, there are people who are swinging from doorposts and slamming their heads into the ground so that they can receive revelation. And Levi Hancock in his, in his autobiography, he says, and I believed it all like a fool, you know? So it's, it's very, it's very uh, fun that he, uh, he, he, he talks about that. Anyway, his son, Mosiah will in his life autobiography, which is essentially, it, we don't have the manuscript of this, but we have is a typescript that's created by his daughters. But as far as I'm aware, the original of that autobiography we don't have. Now, that's going to come become important later. Anyway, in his autobiography, he makes a claim that he has a vision of the pre-mortal life. And this vision has been reported multiple times. And so I think that might also work its way into kind of the wider Latter-day Saint culture. Um, this is what he says in, in his... Now, again... He is not a prophet, okay? This is just in his autobiography. I shall now return to Payson. At about the time I was one and 20 years of age, thank you for that very, very erudite way of saying that, I know not whether to call it a dream or a vision. Some have classed it a dream. I do not expect to give it in full. For me, it is sacred. Beyond expression, especially some of the things I have no power to describe in words or express in writing. Methought I was taken away somewhere to, oh, such a glorious realm. I saw he whom at that time we reverently spoke of as the great eternal. I saw the females at his right side. I have no idea their number. I saw the Savior, and calling me by name, he said, Mosiah, I have brought you here that you may know how it was before you went to yonder earth. So, so he's saying that he's having a vision of the pre-mortal life. Again, something we have very little 
revealed doctrine on, Mosiah Hancock is claiming, actually, I saw it. Okay, now this is, again, a vision, dream, he doesn't know. And again, Mosiah Hancock, not a prophet, not an apostle, um, you know, from some good family stock, you know, that, that, that's where we're going to end it there. Um, thinks I, what earth? For it seemed to me that I had no knowledge of an earth. So it's almost like he went retroactively through the veil going the other direction, right, for this vision. He says, as it is written in the beginning, God created man, male and female created he them. And know you that no man is without female and that in the Lord. And no female is with is female without the male and that in the Lord. I shall not attempt to tell how they are formed. Suffice it to say they were created in pairs, the male and his female. And as they came up to the throne of the great eternal, the mothers seemed to name the females and oh, the respect they seem to have. They seem to entertain for each other as they march forth. The right elbow of the female seemed to touch the left elbow of the male. I should judge the males generally to be about six foot, two inches in height and the females some three or four inches less. That's if you're wondering how tall people were in the pre-mortal life. You know, Mosiah Hancock thinks that's six foot two, about six two, and really some relatively tall ladies. Those are tall ladies. Yeah, uh, that's a lot of. Uh, it's it's a decent three, maybe a good shooting guard. You're going to struggle with yeah. rebounding. You're going to struggle with height. But if you can, the paint, well, if you've got a three pointer, yeah, that's true. I mean, if you're if you're a three that's got that outside game, okay. You know, and you know maybe you've got a motor on you where you go in and you you body up for the board and. I would imagine. I'm going to have to give I'm going to have to give a lot of thought to this. Okay. So, this is probably the right time to talk about what some of our spread picks are for the NCAA tournament. Look, the value is is Virginia. There's no question about it. Uh I'm not saying that they're going to win. I'm saying you're getting the best value at plus 3,000. Well, what about what about Tennessee with their twice beating Alabama? That's good. It looks really good. It looks good for uh Alabama's got some Obvious distractions off the court. Um, Tennessee. When you say obvious distractions off the court, does that involve a gun? It does. Okay. Uh, so you have some obvious distractions off the court. Um, you've got Tennessee. They've, they've shown that they can win some of the big games. But right now, I believe they're only plus 2,500. Decent value, I believe. But um, You don't think they're going to close the deal? I don't think they're going to close the deal. Okay. Yeah. You need something- Virginia's been there before. Virginia's you know? more well-rounded. They're right. also the team that lost to the 16 seed at one point. They did. So they've next been there year, before. But the next year, they won the national championship. Right. So you know what? They needed to know the bitter to know the sweet. <laughs> uh, this is a second Nephi chapter two that we've just started talking about. <laughs> anyway, uh, this. So again, remember, this is not doctrine that I am reading. This is like the stuff about Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, the the What's line the on Tennessee. Stance? The line on Tennessee is not doctrine. But um, this this is a vision that he's claiming to have had, a dream that he's claiming to have had. Now, why why am I even reading it at all then? If it's not if it's not doctrine, well, because this is incredibly popular. This autobiography, when it when it gets published, it, it has wide circulation in the 1960s and 1970s. And in fact, there are current Latter Day Saint authors who will often cite to this vision when they're talking about a pre mortal life because there's almost nothing written on it. So I'm bringing it up here. Not to say that I believe this. I don't. Okay. And and I have no historical reason to believe it either. I'm not saying that Mosiah Hancock is a liar. Well, I mean, he very well may have had a dream sure. that was like this. But, but guess but how doctrine comes? Through a second counselor in a Sunday school ward site Sunday school presidency dream that is published in autobiography <laughs> 70 years after he passes away. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's no, how doctrine No, that's how do- doctrine does not. You know, see, that's that's the whole point is could some of this that's in here be true? Sure. Would I act as if it is? No. And, uh, but let me read just a little bit more. Um, uh, they were instructed in everything that could be imagined, the finest oratory and everything of literary turn, including astronomy, trigonometry, surveying. Well, now I know why I came to earth anyway. I'm like, yeah, Mike's dad was up If there. I have to do trigonometry, <laughs> I might as well go to, <laughs> down to earth. The use of the most delicate machinery. Now, you know, see, you can tell Mosiah Hancock is coming from a an earlier age. The females were taught to weave and to knit and to sew. That's Interesting. Good. Yeah. Oh, the music in those spheres. 
I seem inadequate to touch upon the least of those accomplishments of heavenly characters, yet they were so orderly and harmonious that it seemed as if one could hear a pin drop. I saw someone who became more efficient in science or other knowledge, and they were advanced from class to class. So apparently the premortal life is this giant university class, and you, you go from class to class. Um, it seemed as if the female always kept her companion, for they were always together, for I never saw one fall behind. Even those who uh, had been placed to overlook the classes were always together, the male overlooking the males and his female looking over the females. I even had a companion with me that needed no prompting. It seemed that I had been with the Savior so long. It seemed that I wore the same vesture as his. All at once, a heavenly voice seemed to reverberate, as it were, through the immensity of space um, and, uh, and said, Hear all ye, O my children, we have a world for you in which you can dwell, and you can have a chance of coming up as we have come up. And then he goes on to kind of basically tell the story of the, of the Grand Council for which we do have scriptures. So you'll notice that at least a key part of his vision, not talking about children, but certainly talking about spouses, right? That that all men and women, they were together. They were together from the very beginning. He also uh, will talk about um, his parents. He will say, uh, after he tells the story of the, um, of the, the, War in heaven, basically. The one called Levi became my father, and the one called Clarissa was my mother here on earth. My father seemed a savior as he strove to bring me up in the admonition of the Lord. And blessed be the name of my parents. Clarissa became my mother, and she certainly did a Christian duty to me. But there are others who have no right with me or mine, and I cheerfully leave that in the hands of one that I know doeth all things well. So, here he's suggesting yeah, that he that, knew his parents, that and... he knew his parents, that there was some kind of a selection process. And so this is a way that something like this might make its way into. Now, I, do I believe that the writers of Saturday's Warrior were reading this? Probably not. Probably not. Maybe. You know what? Maybe because it was actually quite popular at the same time that the, the, the movie and, and play are being made. Um, this is actually a really problematic source in, in part because we don't, you know, first of all, not a prophet. Let me just repeat, not doctrine. Not a doctrine, not doctrine, not a prophet. Yeah. Next okay. came Mosiah Hancock, isn't in the song. Yeah, yeah. A mighty but, man, but, was yeah, it? Mosiah, Mosiah Hancock. Hancock was seventh, we know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even on dude at that point. It's just, it's like a, a, a trumpet with a broken key at that point. Anyway, um, it becomes more problematic because in 1969, a an apostate publisher... Uh, uh, someone who, well, I, I don't, I guess he's not a po- apostate yet. He gets excommunicated, I think in 1973. Right. Um, he, he, his name's Ogden Kraut and he publishes a lot of, uh, uh, you know, documents related to, well, why is he getting excommunicated? Well, because he's teaching that people should still be practicing polygamy and, and, and the whatnot. And, um, he publishes a version of this that is greatly expanded claiming that he has a manuscript of this again, that no one has seen the manuscript and it just so happens to fall along the lines of things that he politically believed. It, it is a very interesting thing that whether it's, you know, the John Pontius and visions of glory or whether it's, you know, uh, you know, uh, other people claiming to have revelations or conversations with it. It always seems to be that the vision people have, is literally what they already believed in the first place. This is one of my favorite things that you like to bring up as it relates to Joseph Smith, is that uh, some of the visions that he has and some of the doctrine that he brings forward is actually something that's absolutely not popular in any way whatsoever. Many of the things he brings forward. I mean, talking about the martyrdom in general. I mean, plural marriage is a big part of what the claims are in the novel expositor and, and plural marriage, you know, that, that they're practicing it in secret. That is a lot, but they're almost as much of that paper is devoted to the fact that Joseph Smith is teaching false doctrine and not just plural marriage, that he's teaching that there's a plurality of gods, that he's teaching that God became God, that he's teaching that we can become like God. Those things are so radical. It's also, you know, part of the reason why that this is, this is false doctrine that's being taught. And yet you get these kind of visions where people claim they have visions of the afterlife and things like that. 
And not always. I, I, look, I don't want to indict every single... I, I believe that people can receive you know, personal revelation. But often, when people are making these public pronouncements of visions, boy, it certainly just seems to follow what they already believed. Right. It's just, it's like, Hey, you were so right. You didn't even know how right you were as opposed to Joseph's visions where he didn't think that his brother Alvin could go to the celestial kingdom. And then God shows him Alvin in the celestial kingdom by vision. That that's not what Joseph already thought. In fact, Joseph's response is I marveled, meaning he's stunned. He is stunned, but God, you told me no one can go to the celestial kingdom who hasn't been baptized. You're the one who told me that. I'll give you more detail in a couple of years. Yeah, exactly. He's <laughs> like, well, you know, I'm not going to answer that for you right now. Let's put a pin in it. And we're going to circle back. Um, and, you know, it, it is. It's another four years before Joseph has the doctrine of, of, of baptism for the dead revealed to him. So this expansion of this vision is highly problematic, but it circulates on the Internet as well. Because it got published, people loved how much more detail it had, and it, it's also highly racist. Um, it perpetuates um, something that that was very common among um, fundamentalist Latter Day Saints and 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 of various stripes. There's various organizations of people that were fundamentalists. Many of them rejected official declaration too. They rejected the fact. Uh, that the priesthood uh, and temple rights would be extended to all races. Um, and so in this expanded version that Kraut published, it you know makes an entire claim that there's an entire race of people who were not valiant in the war in heaven and therefore they couldn't that you know that they they were uh, you know set aside as a different race on earth, which is 100% false doctrine. Um, and Brigham Young will speak specifically to that doctrine being a false doctrine because people, again, once you understand that there is a pre-mortal life, then you start to ask questions, right? When there's not a pre-mortal life, you don't have to ask any questions at all. But once there is one and well, there are many of the noble and great ones and people thought, you know, well, some people were ordained to their offices right before they came. Oh, this God foreordained you to be this person, foreordained you to do this. Well, that begs the question then of, of other things that took place in the pre-mortal life. And so even in the mid-Utah period, uh, during a time of, of you know, obvious slavery and, and, um, and horrific treatment of African, uh, African-Americans, as well as African slaves, there were still some that were from Africa at that point. The, it was a common thing for people to try to work their Latter Day Saint theology, which is that there is a preexistence, into a way to justify how something as horrific as slavery could exist. And so, one of those justifications was, well, maybe the people that were slaves weren't valiant in in the pre mortal life. And Brigham Young is going to expressly speak against that. In fact, let me pull up the quote so I can quote it directly. This is from Wilfred Woodruff's journal. Um, and it's actually, it's December 25th, 1869. So it's on Christmas. Um, and they have a School of the Prophets meeting where they're, you know, having discussions, which they reconstitute the School of the Prophets when they're in Utah. And as Wilfred Woodruff writes it, many questions were asked President Young, uh, uh, were asked. President Young answered them. Lorenzo Young asked, so this is a quoting from his journal. Lorenzo Young asked if the spirits of Negroes were neutral in heaven. He said, someone said Joseph Smith said they were. President Young said, no, they were not. There was no neutral spirits in heaven at the time of the rebellion. All took sides. He said that if anyone said that he heard the prophet Joseph say that the spirits of blacks were neutral in heaven, he would not believe them. For he heard Joseph say to the contrary, all spirits are pure that come from the presence of the Father. So you have Brigham Young pretty definitively stating against that. Now, of course, there's other people that are going to circulate those things. And um, we uh, don't have the, the the time or capacity to dive into all of that. 
um, it, that history. But this doctrine of premortal life is something that there are anecdotal sources, but next to those anecdotal sources, there's also attempts to try to 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 expand on those, at which are which are even further uh, anecdotal. So. Now, let me get back to your original question, because I think, did we even cover the question at all? Well, uh, what was the question? No, it no. was it was about uh, that. Well, so the one particular sister said that she spoke matter of fact that we picked right. our families in heaven. Right. And so, look, there is um, a, 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 there there is a, a, a church um, statement on this through a church magazine that's relatively uh, recent. Very um, still very difficult to find. However, it was an obscure magazine. Well, that we... I mean, like I spent hours and days, and, <laughs> and you know, but this is from the New Era of June 2016. The title of the question is: Did we choose our families and spouses in the premortal life? All right, Angie. Look, um, apparently this was much easier to find than uh, no, than no, it, d- no. It took me a long time to find. It. <laughs> what? What? It did? No, 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 no. Kay. I'm sorry, Angie. We it, the answer. We don't know. Okay. So first and <laughs> foremost, the answer is we don't know. So, so no one should be definitively yeah, saying that they do. Now, look, maybe, I understand why yeah, someone possibly. might feel like they do. Like, you don't understand. I have a connection with my wife that is such. I know we knew each other in the pre That we knew each other in the pre-mortal life. I think that's, that's a given. We all existed forever. So, yes, we all knew one another. Did we choose what families we'd be placed in? That is something that it's a speculation that the church's response is we don't know. There are a few things we know for certain about premortal life. For instance, we know that we had agents. There, sorry, there are a few things we know for certain. We know that we had agency. We are allowed to accept Heavenly Father's plan of salvation or to rebel with Lucifer. We know that in the premortal life, some people were foreordained to certain callings or offices which sometimes may have meant being part of a certain lineage. What has been revealed about our use of agency in the premortal world seems to highlight our consenting to Heavenly Father's plan and perhaps making covenants with Him related to some foreordained office or calling. We don't know how much detailed knowledge of our earthly circumstances we may have had when we consented to the plan, but the revelations say nothing about our having commitments to one another or our having our, our having chosen our parents or spouses. So that that seems to be about as clear as you can get. And there's actually a couple of other articles specifically about the idea of do I have a soulmate? You know, American culture loves the idea of like, oh, you know, we're getting married. He's my soulmate. She's my soulmate. Well, if she's your soulmate and then, you know, she, you know, commits a, adultery on you and moves in, you know, with her masseuse, what now? Right? I mean, the, again, the idea of a soulmate, that there's literally one person out there for you, sounds great when you are, you know, proposing on bended knee at the Logan Temple. It, it That's where I proposed to Angie. Um, it doesn't sound as great when you've had some kind of horrific experience in that marriage. Because now what? Now you know that there's divorce or 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 something like that. Does that mean I literally can't be happy in any other marriage? So the church has multiple times in modern times refuted the idea that there's only one single person out there that you could have been married to and happy with. So that also kind of speaks against this idea of, oh, I chose this person before. I had a you know eternity to do it. I just chose the wrong person. I mean that kind of thing, right? So. The idea that that there's only one person you could be happy with is is just that's been refuted by church authorities. So this idea of you know well in the premortal existence we we certainly knew each other. There's a there's a great story about Hubie Brown that's uh, told by Truman Madsen. It's actually in uh, in um, uh, the Truman G. Madsen story, A Life of Study and Faith, by uh, by his son. And friend of the show, uh, Barney Madsen. Yep, um, huge fan of Barney and his his wife. We had and family. a great lunch with them. It was it was great. It was well, awesome. I will say one of my favorite parts about that. And so, so Richard, what what is it that that you that you do 
You know what? That's a great question. There's a lot of people who ask that. Who was it who asked the uh, podcast a few weeks ago? Or that? Yeah. So what does Richard add? And, uh, well, it was funny because it was it was it wasn't in any sarcastic way. It was so. So what do you do? What's your interest in history? What? You know, actually, I don't know anything about history. Not uh, not a single thing. Um, but then he did regale them with rice tariffs for the remainder of the meal. <laughs> Which reminds me, as a as a side uh, tangent here, uh, the the monthly newsletter. The um, what is it? The what are we calling the the newsletter? I Standard think, of Truth I think, newsletter. I think it's just Is called newsletter. Okay. <laughs> we went out on a limb. I, he kept trying to name it things like crinkling leaves. So we had to just yeah, like it's right. called newsletter. Newsletter. So uh, we we did release a newsletter. It came out. Uh, well, this is coming out a couple of weeks after this. Uh, the newsletter was released. Garrett uh, regaled us with a with a story of uh, false prophets. It was very, very funny with a nice, thoughtful it's my, message. Well, it's my favorite topic, obviously. Right? False prophets. If anyone knows false prophets, <laughs> it's Garrett Dirtlock. <laughs> so anyway, so we highly, uh, we it comes very highly recommended by uh, by us that you should subscribe to the monthly newsletter. It is free, and uh, the content reflects the price. <laughs> uh, so, so. As does this podcast. <laughs> that's right. Um, so anyway, th- it's a, it's a great it's a great story that's that's in this book, and I believe it's also in uh, in his in his audio tapes. It is of, in the tapes. Yeah. Yep. Of um, I think it's in the Timeless Questions actually. Yeah, Timeless Questions Gospel yeah. Insights yeah. series. Um, also available on the YouTube's. Um, and so it's it's about uh, Hubie Brown. Um, and he's he's saying he says. Uh, as they were side by side, it was, he says, like an electric shock. Both walked a few steps further, stopped, turned around, and stared. <clears throat> then they walked on. President Brown later learned that this was Orson F. Whitney, who became a member of the Council of the Twelve. Quote, I am as certain as I live, he said to me, that I have known him in the pre-mortal world. So just just to the point is that we we all knew each other in the pre well we we, we didn't know all know everybody that, perhaps, well, I but, mean, but that there certainly was interactions in the premortal existence we we don't know the extent to our knowledge I mean we, we pass through a veil and and the problem with that is not only do we not remember anything I don't know how much of that you know clouds what we what we would have known otherwise and so the 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 veil makes it so we don't really know what those relations were like. But it certainly seems like we would know each other, especially those who are fighting on the father's side in in the great war in heaven, and which is literally every person you've ever met. Every person you've ever met, every person you will ever meet, chose Jesus in the pre-mortal life, or they would not be here. So in answer to your question, then, um, I would say I would certainly would not teach it as doctrine. In fact, in a church setting, I wouldn't teach it at all. If someone were to bring it up, I would say there have been people and and Latter Day Saint musicals that have that have theorized or claimed things like that, but it is not something that is currently taught as doctrine of the church. And in fact, it, you know, the most recent thing, which is that New Era article, specifically suggests otherwise, or at the very least, says we do not know. So if we don't know, then we shouldn't teach people that we do. Anyway, uh, I think we may have run out of time. For- we've, we've run out of time. When I started the podcast episode, I said we're going to talk about the name of the church and, and how it changed over time. And uh, that's just a tease because apparently we'll do that next week. So next week, uh, we're going to be – Andrew, we're going to get to your your question and your, your comments. What if this is the last week Andrew ever decides to listen? Well, he's going on a mission. I don't know if he's all just, like just about to leave or if he's just So about we are to doing him papers. a great disservice at this moment. Yeah, you know what, Andrew? You'll get to this in two years when you get back. Yeah, when you get back, when we've gone off the air a year and a half after you know that, then yeah. That's true. I have one question, Andrew. Will you wait for us and listen to this um, when you get back? We hope you will. Thank you for listening to the Standard of Truth podcast, hosted by historian Dr. Garrett Dirkmott. If you know anybody that could benefit from the material in this episode, please share it with them. And for more resources, visit standardoftruth.com. Until next time.